If you're headed for divorce and live in Florida, you need to watch or listen to this webinar. Hi everyone, my name is Christopher Bruce and this is the Basics of Florida Divorce Law Overview. And the objective of what we're going to do in this uh, seminar here is help you understand the most important concepts that the law is likely to apply to your divorce. And this law is based on Florida law and it's going to be different in some of the other states, but uh, for the most part, uh, in a lot of places in the country, the law is going to be uh, the same. Um, this course isn't a substitute for a competent divorce lawyer. Make sure you, you talk to one before you do anything and understand that uh, listening to this does not create any type of attorney-client relationship between yourself and uh, my law firm, the Bruce Law Firm. So, if you are going to be headed for divorce, what do you need to do? Um, if you want to have the best divorce possible, you need to understand the laws that are going to apply to your divorce. And when I say that, all you really need to know are the basics of the relevant law because all that governs the boundaries of what is typically going to be in the settlement that you're going to negotiate for. Uh, thankfully, you know you don't have to bother with learning about 99% of what the typical divorce lawyer knows. You just need to know the basics of the areas of the law that are going to be relevant in your divorce. And here in this course, basically, what we're covering are laws of splitting property. Sometimes they call it equitable distribution. We're going to cover alimony, spousal support issues. We're going to cover attorney's fees in divorce and at the very end we're going to cover children's issues including time sharing, re parental responsibility, and child support. Uh, we're leaving the children's issues towards the end so that if you're watching this and don't have kids uh, you'll be able to stop and um, end the video before uh, some of the material that won't be really relevant to you. In a divorce, there is the need to divide property. And with few exceptions, each spouse is going to receive half, 50% of what's called the marital net worth. And the marital net worth is a term used to describe the assets or liabilities that either spouse accumulates during the marriage. So if something was earned, created, saved uh, during the marriage or a debt was incurred during the marriage, it's going to be part of the marital net worth. Uh, there's a few exceptions to this. Uh, if, get, if gifts or money was received and inherited during the marriage from somebody else other than your spouse, then it's going to be considered a non-marital property if that property was kept separate and not, not mixed together. So basically speaking what Florida divorce law says is with a few exceptions um, you're basically gonna have an equal split of the marital net worth judges can adjust it a little bit in favor of one spouse or another but that doesn't happen very often so just as an example of this um, assume Jack and Jill uh, they go up a hill to fetch a pail of water they get married on the way down and now they're getting divorced <laughs> Um, if they have marital assets totaling $2 million and marital liabilities totaling $1 million, um, in a divorce scenario, their marital net worth is a total of $1 million. And the way you figure that out is they have $2 million of assets, $1 million of liabilities, so the, the $2 million minus the $1 million is a $1 million net worth. So in a divorce, Jack and Jill... Uh, since they have a one million dollar marital net worth that they're dividing um, equally, they're each going to leave the marriage with five hundred thousand dollars. So that's uh, hopefully you see how that works. One million dollars is the marital net worth. Everybody gets fifty percent of that, so that's five hundred thousand dollars for each spouse. Now, kind of give you the same example, except uh, show that somebody had non-marital property. Um, in this case, it's it's the same facts, $2 million of marital assets and $1 million of marital liabilities, but 
Jill inherited a million dollars uh, during the marriage that she put into a separate account and, and never mixed with anything else. And in that case, the marital net worth is still the same, $1 million. Uh, Jack and Jill would still each leave the marriage with half of that $1 million, um, $500,000 each. And in this case, uh, Jill would keep her inheritance of a million dollars. So at the end of the day, she'd actually be leaving the marriage with a net worth of $1.5 million. That's her $500,000 half share of the marital net worth plus her $1 million dollar inheritance. A few other, pro a few other um, items when it comes to dividing property. Um, each item of property or bank account is not always divided equally. Uh, the goal for each spouse is to leave the marriage with basically the same marital net worth. And it doesn't mean that each and every account or asset is divided in half. It's just everybody leaves the marriage with the same value of things. Um, if you want to claim in a divorce that an asset should be considered non-marital, uh, meaning that it was maybe inherited or you had it before the marriage and you don't want to divide it with your spouse, then it's your burden of proof. You have to be able to show that you had the particular piece of property before the marriage or that you inherited the money from someone or somebody gave you the gift of that asset and it wasn't for working. It's your burden to prove that. Um, sometimes that can be very difficult when you've been very married a very long time. I've had clients that have been married over 30 years and they want to try to prove what they had when they got married and it can be a very difficult thing to do unless there was very good record keeping. Also, we've been talking about the concept that each spouse leaves the marriage with half the marital net worth and in Florida it's not exactly that simple all of the time. Uh, in equitable distribution states like Florida, the judge has the discretion to make an unequal distribution of the marital net worth, but in practice, this hardly ever happens. Um, basically, judges can, uh, for certain factors, adjust um, how much property people get. Very rarely does it result in somebody getting um, any different than half the property, but uh, I have seen examples to where people get a little bit more than half, um, especially in very, very short marriages to where somebody has an inheritance and they accidentally mix the inheritance with um, non-marital, um, or excuse me, they mix the inheritance with marital property and, you know, technically the assets that they have are all uh, marital and should be divided half with their spouse but the judges step in and say hey look I mean these people have just been married a short period of time this person accidentally mixed their money it's just not fair in this situation but in you know 99 percent of cases it's going to be a half 50 50 split of the marital net worth especially when people have been married um, you know a long period of time you know, one of the more important things that comes up in the cases that I handle, I, I handle a lot of divorce cases that involve businesses, and um, is how do you value the business? How is it dealt with? Well, a, a business has to be valued in the divorce just like anything else. And, you know, you have to value each and every aspect of, of the business. In many cases, what happens is accountants get involved and we look to the balance sheet of the business to determine what everything is worth and in many instances you know we have appraisals done of certain items on the balance sheet to adjust the values to what their actual value is but basically in in most divorces the value of the business is the adjusted net book value of the company and that's the assets of the company minus the liabilities of the company after you make certain adjustments to items on the company balance sheet. One thing that those with businesses should know is the concept of how goodwill is valued or not valued in a divorce. In divorce cases, unlike selling a business, if there is a goodwill value, meaning the business is worth more than the actual balance sheet says it's worth, 
in almost all cases that goodwill is not a marital asset to be divided. If the goodwill of the company, the value over the balance sheet um, amount is related to the reputation of the spouse in the divorce, uh, meaning people come to the business because of that person. Um, in many cases, this is what happens with lawyers, with doctors, with, with many types of businesses. If people go to the business because of the reputation of the spouse, uh, typically any goodwill, if it exists, is going to be called personal goodwill and it's not going to be valued in the divorce. If a non-compete agreement would need to be signed to sell the business, meaning if you're going to sell the business to somebody else and as part of that, they make you sign a contract saying you're not going to compete with them. If that's the case, um, in most all situations, any goodwill is going to be considered personal goodwill and it's not going to be valued as a marital asset in the divorce. So, you know, a divorce with a business could make up an hour-long uh, seminar in itself, and probably uh, I'll cover that here at one point in time. But for now, you need to know if, if you have a business, it's most likely going to be valued at the uh, adjusted net book value of the balance sheet of the business. And um, in many cases, you're going to need to get a very competent divorce lawyer that uh, has a background in accounting and also probably a forensic accountant involved to help value the, uh, the business. Spousal support and alimony. This is probably one of the more important topics in the divorce cases that I handle outside of valuing uh, the business or the assets. And what spousal support or alimony is, is the payment of support from one spouse to the other after the divorce. In some states, there are now formulas for the amount of alimony and the length of time that is paid. Florida, as of the recording of this, does not have a formula for alimony. Uh, this is being recorded in uh, January of 2017. So if you are listening to this after that time, you might um, check in for some updates on the uh, the website brucepa.com because there's currently an alimony reform bill being proposed that might change the law on this. But um, with alimony, uh, the key issues basically are will alimony be paid, how much will it be if it is paid, and how long will the alimony be paid. So on the first part of this, will alimony be paid, there's a few core concepts that I'll take you through. Alimony is a, a very complex topic, especially with how the law is here in Florida, but you can boil a lot of the most important information down to a few core concepts. And the first concept is for alimony to be paid, there has to be both a need for alimony and the ability to pay alimony. The person asking for alimony needs to need it, and the person who would be paying alimony actually has to have the ability to pay it after um, taking care of their own expenses. If one person does not need alimony, or the other person does not have the ability to pay alimony, then there's usually not going to be any alimony. Um, second big picture core concept is that the need for alimony or the ability to pay alimony can be determined based on what a spouse is capable of earning if their actual earnings are lower than they should be. And what I mean by that is this. Somebody cannot just decide to, you know, as a divorce is starting, to not go to work anymore and not get paid and then turn around and say, hey, hey judge, I need alimony to pay my expenses because I don't have any income. Or, um, on a similar token, they can't just quit their job or purposely get fired um, in order to be able to say, hey judge, I don't have enough money to pay my spouse alimony. The law kind of sees around that. If it's proven that somebody is capable of making more money than they are currently, then their need for alimony from their spouse is going to be determined based on that higher income level. They call this imputed income. Same thing if uh, the person trying to pay 
alimony, or I guess better described, uh, trying to avoid paying alimony is making less than they could be making. Um, the divorce court judges will impute income to them in the amount that they could be making. Basically, they say, hey, you can make whatever you want. You want to be a school teacher when you've got a law degree? You can go teach math class at the local elementary school, but we're going to treat you like you're making uh, lawyer money when it comes to figuring out how much money you can pay your spouse in alimony. So it's kind of a, a tricky thing to deal with proving at trial. It's not automatic. You have to hire uh, vocational evaluators and, and put on the right evidence to prove what somebody's capable of making. It's, it's more complicated than just walking into court and saying it, but um, the need and ability to pay is, is based on the actual or the um, capable earnings of, of the spouse um, if they're proven. Core concept number three is alimony is only paid from income with very few exceptions. Basically, the income from all sources of a person is considered in their ability to pay alimony or their need for alimony, and that includes if they have investment accounts or assets that can be earning a rate of return, um, including IRAs and, and other tax-deferred investment accounts. If, if somebody has money that could be making money, then that is considered part of their income for analyzing their need for spousal support or their ability to pay spousal support. Core concept number four, once spouses are leaving the marriage with a lot of money, divorce court judges are less inclined to order alimony. So, you know, there's case law down here in Florida that says if you're going to have a few million dollars after the divorce, you, you really don't need alimony. Um, this part of the law is not crystal clear, but it's pretty persuasive, especially with uh, most of the South Florida judges that I deal with. Another core concept, um, by statute, alimony typically cannot result in one spouse being paid more than 50% of the other spouse's income. In other words, um, the law in Florida does not allow for somebody having to pay every cent they own to the other person so that the other person can live in a nice house and they have to, you know, live under a bridge. It's just not how it works. The law limits the amount of alimony absent exceptional extreme circumstances to um, half of the spouse's income. So how much alimony will be paid? If you really wanted a, a general formula um, for Florida alimony, um, if the person paying alimony has the ability to pay every last dime, the general formula would be alimony equals uh, expenses minus the after-tax income of the person who needs alimony. So, and these are very just simple examples, but if somebody's expenses are $4,000 a month and income is $3,000 a month, then the alimony would be $1,000 a month. That's the expenses minus um, the after-tax income um, equals the $1,000. Um, and this formula, it's, I'm just trying to give a basic example, but it assumes the expenses of each person are reasonable and in line with what the expenses were during the marriage and that the other spouse has the ability to pay alimony. If there's not a need or ability to pay, there's, there's not going to be alimony. But this is just a simple illustration uh, to show you the, the concept uh, behind alimony. Um, when you look to the need of somebody for alimony in a divorce here in Florida, you have to understand that need is based on the standard of living during the marriage. If you know you lived a Honda Civic lifestyle during the marriage, then you're not going to get alimony that's um, going to provide for a Ferrari lifestyle after the divorce. And Sometimes you need to have a, an accountant get involved in these divorce cases where alimony is being contested and they'll actually prepare what's called a need study, which is a study of how much money was spent on different categories of items in the uh, end of the marriage to determine how much um, each type of expense 
was for a spouse, um, and that's used to determine how much the spouse will need after the divorce. And alimony does not, you know, cover every single luxury of life, but it's going to cover most of the things that you and your spouse were spending money on during the divorce historically. So how long will alimony be paid? Um, in some states, there's currently a formula to determine how long uh, the alimony uh, payments go. In Florida, as of now, there is no formula. It might be coming, so you know, stay tuned with the current status of the law. But uh, in Florida, the, the current way it goes is um, alimony is going to be categorized as either permanent, meaning it goes until death, remarriage, or retirement, or something less than permanent. And how this is all determined is based on the length of the marriage. If you have a marriage that's longer than 17 years, then typically um, the alimony is going to be um, permanent alimony, which goes until death, remarriage, or retirement if alimony is needed. Um, and, you know, when a marriage is less than 17 years or permanent alimony is not awarded, the judges in Florida have discretion to determine how long the alimony is paid. Kind of a rule of thumb I usually tell my clients is alimony is usually going to be paid about half the length of the marriage and shorter marriages, basically long enough for somebody to get back on their feet and earn enough money to become self-supporting. In marriages longer than 17 years, um, typically the, the alimony is going to be permanent if there is a need for it, and it's going to go until death, remarriage, or reasonable retirement. This is something that you're going to need to talk to your lawyer about because there's a lot of specifics and nuances in the law with this, and depending on exactly where you live, which state, which judge, it's going to be different. That's why they're trying to get uniform alimony laws here in Florida right now. But uh, this is a very fact-intensive analysis, but just in, in generalities, if you have a marriage longer than 17 years and you need alimony, usually that's going to be permanent. If you have a marriage less than 17 years, then the alimony is usually going to be at least half the length of the marriage. It can be by statute up to as long as the marriage, but you usually don't see that very often. So can alimony ever be changed after a divorce? The answer is it depends, but it certainly can. Permanent alimony um, is somewhat of a misnomer uh, because it terminates upon uh, death or remarriage of the person who is receiving the alimony or the death of the person paying the alimony or upon the retirement of the person who's paying the alimony if the retirement is reasonable. Um, also, alimony can be reduced or terminated if the person receiving the alimony is not actually uh, married but is cohabitating, basically living with a significant other. And it's a, it's kind of a tricky analysis to prove all that, but um, you know, what you need to understand if, if you're receiving uh, permanent alimony is it can change in the future. And uh, in many cases, the same goes for the other types of alimony. Uh, all of the types of alimony will end if the person who is paying it dies um, or if the person receiving the alimony gets remarried. Uh, and if there's cohabitation of the, the person receiving the alimony with a significant other then that can be subject to termination as well. When it comes to the alimony ending upon somebody retiring, usually that retirement has to be at what's deemed a reasonable retirement age, which is usually in the age 65 to 67 area, unless somebody has um, you know, a profession to where historically people retire a little bit earlier and um, they don't have the ability to work in any other field. Um, but, you know, 
the modification of alimony could you know fill a whole hour with all the nuances of it but you just need to understand if you're getting permanent alimony or any other type of alimony that it's not necessarily uh, set in stone forever it is hard to change um, but the law does allow it to be changed if circumstances change um, the burden for somebody to change alimony is pretty technical but they basically have to show that there's been a change in circumstances that is substantial unforeseen permanent and involuntary somebody's not uh, allowed to uh, just work less uh, and say they don't have as much money to pay alimony um, and alimony is not meant to allow the other spouse to save money either so if it's shown that somebody doesn't need as much money as they said they did in their divorce and they're saving money then that can be a basis to change support but it is an uphill battle to change the amount of alimony and uh, the case law in Florida makes it so that you know people just can't settle their divorce, agree to pay a certain amount of money, and then show up the next day and try to wiggle out of the deal. It's it's not as simple as that, but the alimony can be changed, and that's the important thing to remember. Third major topic that we're covering here are attorneys' fees in a divorce. Florida has attorney fee sharing laws that are set up in theory to allow each spouse equal access to lawyers. And the idea behind this is if one spouse controls all of the money, then they can be required to pay the reasonable fees and costs of the other spouse's lawyer if they have the financial ability. And if the assets and income are similar after the divorce, then the spouse is likely going to have to pay for their own lawyer. And sometimes during a more complicated the divorce, um, there's going to be a hearing early on called a temporary relief hearing to where the other spouse will be asking for the wealthier spouse to pay for their lawyer. What all this is, is set up to do is to make it so that people are on equal financial footing. During the divorce, they each have the ability to have a competent lawyer represent them. Most lawyers, including myself, are not going to work on hopes and dreams. They need to be paid for what they do, so they're going to need to be paid, in many cases, up front. And these laws, uh, the attorney fee sharing laws, allow somebody to be able to hire their lawyer and then if the divorce is complicated, go into court and get the money to pay their lawyer to do a good job for them and uh, you know adequately represent them during the divorce even though they didn't have the money to pay the lawyer. They can make their spouse do it. So how do these laws work? I'll give you a few examples here. In general though, remember the concept is that if one spouse has all of the money and uh, they have significant assets they're likely going to have to pay for their other spouse's lawyer if both spouses leave the marriage with uh, the same amount of money they're probably going to pay for their own lawyer um, in this example uh, jack and jill again and assume that in the divorce they each receive a quarter million dollars in net marital assets and Jack makes $150,000 a year and Jill doesn't work. Um, maybe she's a stay-at-home mother. Um, in this case, I mean, normally you'd look at the facts and say, hey, Jack's getting a quarter million dollars and he's making $150,000 a year. That's a lot of money. He should be able to pay for Jill's lawyer. And in Florida, not necessarily the case. If by the time uh, Jack pays alimony and child support to Jill, his income is about the same as hers. Um, if that's the case and each party leaves the marriage with a quarter million dollars or so and Jill's income is equal to Jack's after he pays support they're each going to pay probably for their own lawyer similar example that involves Jack and Jill if they each receive a quarter million dollars in assets in the divorce and um, Jack is making the hundred and fifty a year and paying alimony and child support to Jill, just like the last example, but leaves the marriage with, say, $2 million in non-marital assets. 
in this scenario, Jack's likely going to have to pay for Jill's lawyer since he has far greater assets after the divorce than she does. There's a financial disparity in assets after the divorce, and that's going to create an entitlement to attorney's fees for Jill. Um, another example, um, assume that um, Jack and Jill each leave the marriage with a quarter million dollars, but uh, Jack is an investment banker earning $5 million a year, and after he pays for Jill's alimony and child support payments, he still has $50,000 a month left over. Um, in this type of case, it's another um, set of facts that comes up in the Florida case law. Jack's going to be considered to have the ability to pay for Jill's lawyer from his income, although his assets aren't you know, extremely high. He has the in he can pay for the attorney out of his income, and uh, it's likely going to be required to do so if Jack and Jill are in divorce court because Jill would have to deplete her assets received in the divorce to pay for her lawyer while Jack can just pay it out of his next month's income. A couple things to keep in mind when it comes to attorney's fee sharing laws in a Florida divorce is one spouse's responsibility to pay for the other lawyer is not completely without limits. The attorney's fees that are going to be paid by the wealthier spouse have to be reasonable and necessary. And if one spouse engages in unnecessary litigation, such as turning down a reasonable settlement offer, then that might affect their ability to have their attorney's fees paid in full. Basically, you have to watch out when you're in a divorce case, even if you think your spouse is going to be required to pay for your lawyer, if a judge later determines that you prolonged the divorce case uh, unnecessarily um, or just over-litigated the case, you're going into court um, every single time um, you sneezed and uh, created a lot of lawyer's fees doing that, uh, that may not have been really necessary, then the judge may limit what the spouse has to pay to your lawyer. So it's, it's kind of common sense. <clears throat> this is basically getting us to the end of these sections on um, all issues that don't involve children. So if you don't have kids under the age of 18, this is probably close to the point in time when um, you can stop watching. Just a few things you should know. Um, my law firm's website, brucepa.com, has a lot of helpful information um, that expands on what you're watching here. There is a free um, My Best Divorce basic series course. Basically, enter an email and get a sign-in for free, and uh, you can get a 14-lesson divorce strategy course. Also, um, I wrote a book. It's called The Best Divorce. It's 400-and-something pages that covers everything you should know from a strategy perspective on uh, planning for and having the best divorce possible. That's a divorce that settles on fair terms at the earliest possible point so that you can uh, minimize the damage that divorce brings to your family, your finances, and to your business and reputation. And you can find that on, on the website. It's at brucepa.com slash best-divorce-book. And also on the website, there's plenty of information about my law firm. Um, the firm primarily handles uh, the more complicated divorces in the South Florida area, prom primarily in Palm Beach, Martin, and Broward counties. The firm's a little bit different than some in that uh, we take on the harder divorce cases under arrangements that uh, do have fixed prices for uh, certain phases of the divorce litigation. We do hourly billing, but we do ha you do have the ability when you hire my law firm to pay a set price and know what your divorce lawyer is going to cost and uh, not worry about that amount really changing. Um, so if you want to learn more, um, go check out the website, brucepa.com. You can also uh, download the book there and uh, watch a few other videos that are going to be helpful for you. If you don't have children under the age of 18, you can probably stop now as the rest of the material in this course here is dedicated uh, to children's type issues. 
So, child custody and child support basics. After the divorce, each spouse is going to have rights to spend time with their children and make decisions about the child, but also um, is going to have a responsibility to contribute to the support of the children. In Florida and a lot of other states, the concept of one parent having custody of the kids is a thing of the past. Um, at least it does not mean what it did 20 years ago. Um, now in a divorce in Florida, the main issues regarding children are how will the parents share what's called time sharing with the kids, how will the parents share parental responsibility over the children, and how will each spouse contribute to the financial support of the children. And we're going to cover all of these issues here in a little bit more detail starting right now with the issue of time sharing. In Florida and a lot of other states uh, the term time sharing is now used to describe how each parent spends time with the children after the divorce. Um, concepts of what's called custody and visitation are largely extinct. They've been written out of the statute. Down where I practice, uh, primarily in Palm Beach and Martin County, um, many of the judges start from the viewpoint that two capable parents should have equal time with their children after the divorce, if possible, if both parents have the same type of job and historically have both been involved with the children just about equally. So if you have two parents that are otherwise good people, that both uh, work full time um, during the work week and have you know historically been involved both with their children after the divorce. Um, you know, in most cases, if a judge is making the decisions, then um, both parents are usually going to have equal time with their kids. I did a, a seminar recently. It's called the Bench Bar Seminar down here in Palm Beach County, and I was part of. Um, running a panel of uh, judges uh, talking and answering questions from our local lawyers and um, two out of the three judges on that panel were saying you know basically they start from this mindset if two parents are equally involved and equally capable then you know they need a darn good reason why they, they shouldn't have an equal type arrangement with their children after the divorce um, you know, usually the worst case scenario uh, down here where I am in Palm Beach County is um, a parent getting what's called the model schedule. And what that works out to is about 38% of the time over the course of the year. And during the school year amounts to having the kids um, every other weekend from Thursday night through Monday morning and on the alternating weeks they have the children from Thursday night through Friday morning it works out to about five out of 14 days and in the summertime they get a little bit more time with the children and this schedule you see going into place a little bit more often when there is a traditional breadwinner working parent and uh, the other parents more of a stay-at-home or part-time a working parent and has been historically involved with uh, the children much more. Not to say that the, the breadwinner parent is, is not a good parent, but they just have usually not during a long period of time been doing as much with the kids as their spouse has. And when you have these types of scenarios, it it's a little bit easier to get um, this... Uh, 38%, 62% schedule. They call it the model schedule here in Palm Beach. Uh, it's still still tricky, though. If the divorce is going to create a situation to where the parent who's been staying home has to go back to work to make the finances uh, work for them, and after the divorce, each parent's going to be working half the time, or is going to be working full time, then we have some judges down here that want to make it to where the time sharing with the kids is equal after the divorce. It's a pretty fact-intensive issue. I, I try to you know, advise my clients to do their best to work this type of stuff out through the mediation process because it, it really does depend on exactly who your judge is right now down here in Florida on these issues. But, you know, 
nobody's losing custody of the kids in a divorce if they're a good hardworking person that's uh, safe to be around their children. Um, so don't don't ever worry about that or let anybody talk you into thinking that that's going to be the case. A couple of things that you should know as it relates to time sharing in Florida is that courts no longer presume a child should be with their mother in the early years of childhood. There used to be a concept called the tender years doctrine that has been um, abolished for about 25 years now. And what that doctrine said was that, you know, mothers are supposed to be the caretakers of the children in their earlier years. And back then, if you get divorced and you had young children, uh, the courts were almost always going to um, have the mother have most of the time with them because that's just how it worked back then. Well, that doctrine in the law is over. It has been now for decades. Many of the newer judges, in my experience, um, don't look at things from um, that perspective. They they grew up in an era to where both parents worked and you know were around the kids, as opposed to uh, mom staying home and dad working. So, um, you know, with the newer judges these days, a lot of them um, start from an a equal 50-50 viewpoint. Um, uh, but in any event, the, the law that used to apply here that says young kids are with their mother, it's, that's out in Florida. Um, another thing that y'all should know is children are not going to be kept from one parent just because the other parent criticizes the other's parenting skills. Um, if one parent thinks the other parent doesn't do it the right way, uh, if they should do things a little bit differently, um, that's not going to be enough to um, prevent... Uh, that parent from having you know time sharing um, after the divorce. I mean, I just use the example sometimes with my wife. We have two young kids, and um, she doesn't like the way sometimes that uh, I give my son a bath or you know heat up the bottles for uh, the baby. And at the end of the day, you know, the, my son gets a, a fine bath, and you know my baby eats when she's with you know me. And um, you know my wife just jokingly sometimes gives me. A little bit of uh, you know crap about it but that's that type of stuff in a divorce uh, that's not going to make a difference um, as long as the children are safe with the other parent uh, that's all that's important if um, you do have a situation that involves one parent having substance abuse issues or you know serious issues a lack of, of judgment they do dangerous things um, then that's a different story and, and the courts will you know, strongly um, evaluate claims of, you know, substance abuse, domestic violence, or proven parental alienation. But unless something like that's going on, uh, minor parenting criticisms aren't going to, you know, make or break a child custody case. A lot of the judges really don't care about that stuff. They just want to make sure that the basics of a child being safe um, and secure and loved um, are covered. Um, child custody is an extremely detailed analysis. The statute that deals with it has, you know, you know, basically twenty something factors that a, a court can consider in determining a child custody case. But big picture basics, um, this is what you need to know when it comes to what goes into determining the time sharing schedule for after a divorce. Second component of children and divorce is what's called parental responsibility. And what parental responsibility is, is the term describing um, how each parent gets to make the decisions for the kids after the divorce. So with children and a divorce, there's three things. There's the time each parent sees them, there's each parent's ability to make decisions, and then there's the child support. We're talking about the decision-making ability here. And how the law basically boils down on this in Florida is that unless one parent's judgment is seriously at issue, parents are usually going to have what's called shared parental responsibility after the divorce, and this means that they're each going to share in the major decision-making for their children. And if there's a, a disagreement, then the judge is basically going to break the tie. Um, this doesn't mean that you know, each parent has to agree on each thing for the kids, you know, usually on things like what the child eats for dinner when they're at mom or dad's house. 
Um, that's that's for that parent to decide. But on the major things like where they go to school, what religion will they be? Are they going to have a elective surgery? Things like that. The parents have to agree on, or a judge breaks the tie. That's typically how it is ordered in a divorce. Um, that said, if it's proven that parents sharing decision-making responsibility would be detrimental for the child, then a judge can order what's called sole parental responsibility or give a parent ultimate decision authority. And that means that uh, one parent would make all the decisions or one parent would make the final decision um, if there's a disagreement on a specific issue. Usually you see this with educational or medical decisions. Now we come to the issue of child support. In Florida and in most other states, child support is determined through a mathematical formula. And that formula basically consists of the following main inputs. There's the income of each parent. There's the number of nights each parent has with the child in a year. And there's how much each parent pays towards certain expenses like daycare and health insurance. This is all basically just a mathematical calculation. There's some, you know, extreme situations to where you have, you know, a very high earning person and the child support can be a little bit lower. But for most cases, uh, child support is a math formula and it's dependent on the numbers that go into the formula. So um, if each person's working, it's what they're making is their income and uh, the number of nights they have with the kids and what they're paying for the children. Um, you do have like an alimony, um, some issues that can come up if a parent is not making as much money as they should. You're not allowed to just not work or you know skip out on working to avoid paying child support. So there's um, an issue to where um, a spouse can be what's called imputed income to them. And um, that's similar with alimony, and you have to prove how much the other person's capable of making. And that can be hard to do, um, but it can be done. <clears throat> a few things just with children, um, you know, and take it for whatever it's worth, but just remember that divorce is going to be hard on your children. You should try your best to keep them isolated from the divorce. Don't play games with your children. Don't screw around with the kids in divorce court. Um, it's going to come back to bite you later when you kids are, your kids are older. If your spouse is jerking you around with your children, you need to see a lawyer immediately. Don't let that situation you know, go on. <clears throat> if you're in a spot to where you allow your a spouse to take advantage of you on children's issues, a judge, if, if this perpetuates over time, um, could see it as you not being interested in your kids. So, you know, if you feel like you're getting jerked around with children, then uh, you need to go talk to a lawyer and don't wait to do that. Also, you need to understand that it's difficult, if not impossible, to modify an agreed-upon child custody settlement unless one parent has seriously messed up. Why that's important is... You know, you can't go into your divorce and think you can just come up with an arrangement for the kids and easily change it down the lo down the road. That's not how it works. Um, it's an extreme uphill burden to change a agreed upon child custody schedule if you don't have the other parent's agreement. So, in your divorce, get it right for the kids. Get it right for the first time. Try to do it as soon as you can. Well, congratulations. You now know most of the basics of what you need to know about Florida's divorce laws. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about all of this, don't forget to check out the uh, basics of, court, of the divorce court process uh, video at the uh, brucepa.com website. Also, we've got uh, several other videos that are going to be up on the website and added here in the near future. If you want to learn more about the divorce process in detail, specifically how, how do you 
go from, you know, say watching this video to getting divorced? What's the uh, strategy? What are the next steps? What's the best way to go through the process? Um, I wrote a whole book covering that. The book is called The Best Divorce, and it's available for a free download at my website, brucepa.com. If you just go to the website, uh, you can find the link to the book. If you want to type it in, it's brucepa.com forward slash best um, dash divorce dash book. And it's 400 or so pages, but you can read it pretty quickly. It's written for the non-lawyer, and if you read that, take a couple hours to read that, you're going to be basically in a a much better spot than than most anyone is uh, as they approach the divorce process. It takes um, everything you need to know, condenses it into one book, and um, tells you um, everything um, from the perspective of a lawyer, not just... Um, a bunch of old wives' tales and nonsense. So it's really helpful. I encourage you to check it out. Also on the website, uh, there's a resources page. There's a 14-lesson uh, course on divorce strategy that's um, complimentary. All you have to do is uh, get a free account on the website, and uh, it gives you access to a few other things, and like some of the webinars here. If you want more information about me, my name is Christopher Bruce. My law firm is the Bruce Law Firm, PA, and we're located in West Palm Beach, Florida. We're happy to um, speak to you about how the firm might be able to help you with your divorce in South Florida. Um, Like I was saying earlier, one of the things that uh, sets the firm apart besides just focusing only on divorce and family law matters is that we will do value-based pricing, basically, we will be able to give you a fixed price for uh, representing you in your divorce, and that way, um, you know you know what your lawyer is going to cost. You don't have to worry about that amount changing, and you can focus on resolving your divorce instead of worrying about you know what the lawyers might cost. So the website is brucepa.com. My name is Christopher Bruce. You can reach out to the firm if you'd like by calling us at five six one. Thank you for listening or watching. I hope this has been helpful to you, and I wish you the best with everything that you might have ahead in your future.